just a few words. Thank you so much to the teachers that have joined us this morning. Uh, my name is Renette Edgar. Um, so I've been the one sending out the emails and the reminders for this awesome event that we're going to be participating in. Um, behind me is Gord Heidel, Executive Director, and, and Doug Stamen, uh, I guess, to my right. Uh, just a quick, um, there was a, a, Leah had sent out, a, and I'll introduce Leah Hermanson in a minute. She is the gal with uh, Egg in the Classroom that has organized this event this morning. Um, she sent out a little reminder through chat. Uh, if we could get your school, um, the number of students participating or, or, or watching, that would be awesome. Uh, thank you to Vibank, Broadview, it looks like Campbell and Miller are joining us this morning. Uh, so thank you for, for fitting us in for this hour. It's going to be awesome. Um, I just wanted to also mention um, on our website at www.rdiec is a link for a student survey. And um, if you wouldn't mind after the presentation, if you have, it literally will take three minutes, probably not even that long. Uh, just to quickly do the survey and submit it, we would be appreciative of that. Uh, we run these surveys just to help us, also to give a little bit of feedback to our presenters, but more so just to help us in planning uh, future events. Uh, so that link can be found on our website at www.rdiec, right in the very top block. You'll see a link that says um, student survey. So thank you, and I'll let Leah take it away. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Leah Hermanson, and I work for Agriculture in the Classroom. And ultimately, my job is to connect students in agriculture. So um, Egg in the Classroom is really lucky to team up with Regina District Industry Education Council to um, do a career spotlight on careers in agriculture science. And we just have a few people that have showed up here in the last couple of minutes. Um, if you uh, can quickly uh, put your uh, your school, the number of students and the subject that you're teaching. Um, we would appreciate that. Just put it into the chat. Um, and I'm going to see if I can get my PowerPoint to actually work. Uh, just for just a few housekeeping items for today's session. Um, please mute your mic. I think everybody um, by default has their mic muted. So if you could just um, keep that on mute, that would be great. Um, we talked about uh, using the chat for all your details. Um, we're going to use the chat for a few things. So um, as, our, as our presenters are talking, if you can um, please, whoops, no, it's working too well. If you can please put all your questions into the chat and we'll have our speakers address those at the end of their presentation. Um, include the student's first name and school because um, they will be entered to win one of three $10 subway gift cards if they ask a question. Um, and with that, I would like to introduce our awesome speakers today. So first up, we have Zoe Aylert. Um, so she works for Nutrien in the double haplet and trait integration lab. She's the manager there. And uh, she has a focus on plant breeding and plant genetics. Um, next up, we have Heather Diabald, and she's the general manager at Quantum Genetics, and she has a focus on plant genetics. And then we have Stacey Howie, who's a lab manager also at Quantum Genetics, and she focuses on animal genetics. So with that, I'm going to pass the mic over to Zoe, and I'll let Zoe take it away. Okay. All right, Leah, is my presentation up? Yep, we're good. Excellent. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Zoe Ellert, and I am the manager of the Double Taploid and Trait Integration Program for our Canola Breeding and Innovation team here at Nutrient Ag Solutions. This morning I'm going to spend a little bit of time going over what it takes to uh, develop a successful canola breeding program and all the disciplines involved in, in that successful canola program. Um, but before I do that, I wanted to provide a little bit of background on myself. And so as a city girl who had never been on a farm when I was at the point of making a decision as to what career to pursue. I owe a lot uh, to my grandfather who convinced me to pursue science through the College of Agriculture. And that's because at that time, 
uh, there were more job opportunities in agriculture than in any other industry when I looked at my science options. And so this is really where I found my passion. And so at Nutrien, our vision is to grow the world from the ground up. And I can honestly say that I'm really excited to be part of agriculture and to utilize innovation to develop sustainable solutions for farmers and to be in an industry that is part of uh, an industry that is helping feed the world. And so my journey really started when I enrolled in the College of Agriculture and completed my degree in Ag Bio and Biotechnology. And I wanted to highlight a few things that I think have been really instrumental in me being able to advance my career in agriculture. Now, the first one is summer student experience. And this allowed me to have the right experience I needed to land my first job. So once I was in the industry, mentorship became extremely important. So finding the right mentors to help me grow and develop some of the knowledge and skills I needed to advance my degree were extremely important. Uh, the other- Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, um, your, your presentation just isn't on presenter um, screen, <laughs> sorry. Oh, that's okay, okay. Um, interrupt, sorry. Is it now? Perfect, okay. Uh, so continuous learning is also something I think is extremely important. And part of that opportunity for me has been to explore uh, new learning opportunities. So I completed my Six Sigma certification and I'm in the process of finishing my MBA. And both these opportunities have opened up many doors to continue to advance my career in, in science and agriculture. All right, so this is a schematic of all of the disciplines involved in the canola breeding process. So many of these disciplines are involved in, in supporting the development of ultimately that hybrid variety that we're looking to commercialize so that farmers have, have uh, new genetics to be able to grow on their farm. And so disciplines including the greenhouse, project management, plant tissue culture, so that's the double haploidy part that I'm going to talk about, molecular breeding, uh, we've got pathology, chemistry, and the field program, these are all disciplines that are required to create the hybrid seed that we sell to the farmer. I wanted to highlight a few new disciplines that are becoming increasingly important in agriculture. So bioinformatics is one of them. And this is where we take genomics or genetics and phenotype and utilize data to create predictions so that we can make advancements on lines that haven't even been evaluated in the field yet. High throughput phenotyping is another area that's becoming increasingly important. So this is where we use drones and drone imagery to complete the agronomic phenotyping that we would normally do just walking the field. And then finally, computer programming is a discipline that's extremely important, especially as we begin to collect all of this data from genomics and from high throughput phenotyping. We need a place to store it. And then we need applications to be able to automate the data processing. So computer programming is becoming increasingly important in our industry. So the first stop in the tour today is going to be the double haploid lab. And so doubled haploids are really plants that are developed from a single pollen grain. Now, this is one of many processes that plant breeders can use to fix all the genetics in one generation and create new inbreds for the breeders to evaluate in the field. Now, if you follow this process, since there's no fertilization of the egg um, to combine two sets of chromosomes, if you were to follow this process, you'd end up with a plant that is uh, haploid and sterile and so of no value to the breeding program. And so we in vitro use a chemical to be able to double the chromosome level so that we have two sets of identical chromosomes in a plant and we call it a doubled haploid. And that doubled haploid has fixed genetics and we can use this plant to evaluate directly in our breeding program to evaluate for certain agronomic characteristics that we're interested in moving through our pipeline. So we rely on our marker team to be able to make selections for us. So the breeders will take um, 
a plant that has really interesting agronomic characteristics or certain disease traits that we're interested in and cross it to another. And then we need molecular markers to support in the selection process. And so our marker team is responsible for three main areas. The first area is marker development. And this is where they discover and develop molecular markers to track the genes that we're interested in, um, in, in keeping in our plants or finding for our, our plants that we're going to end up creating um, into, into varieties that we sell to the farmer. So once we've identified those molecular markers, uh, we then utilize a process called marker assisted screening or marker assisted breeding to make selections. And so plant breeding is really a numbers game. And so we submit thousands of samples to the molecular lab um, from crosses where the plants are now segregating for various traits or genes. And we screen those, identify the plants that have the right combination of genes that we're interested in. And then we continue to move those through our pipeline. The third area that the marker team is responsible for is quality assurance. So once we've identified lines that are going to be uh, seeds that we sell to the farmer, we have these seed lots that we need to evaluate for purity to make sure that only the best genetics go into the seed bag that we sell to the farmer. Now, one trend that I wanted to point out in molecular biology is the trend of automation. So when, you know, when I started in this industry 18 years ago, everything was extremely manual. So a technician was um, required utilizing pipettes and they manually touched everything in the entire process. Now we're really relying on automation to increase the high throughput screening capabilities of our, our team so we can evaluate more things and identify those key lines that we need to advance. Now the next step in automation is really going to be integration. So this is where we're integrating a number of automated pieces of equipment using robotic arms to be able to feed the various instruments that are responsible for completing the process in our marker lab. Now we don't have molecular markers for all the traits that we're interested in. And this is where our plant pathology team is extremely important. And so this team is focused on understanding and identifying key pathogens that impact canola. And so we focus on blackleg and clubroot. And the main goal is for this team to screen a diverse set of material and look for material that has um, resistance to those pathogens. And so essentially we introduce the pathogen to a number of our plants and then we evaluate uh, the plants for some sort of response. So that could be anywhere from a plant that's completely resistant and so there's no indication of infection all the way through to plants that have died from the pathogen. So finally, field evaluation is extremely important because again, we don't have molecular markers for all of the agronomic characteristics that we're interested in. And so we have a global breeding program and field programs in North America, Australia, and our contra season in Chile. And so the contra season in Chile allows us to be able to evaluate our material twice a year. So once in North America and once in Chile, or once in Australia and then once in Chile. And this allows us to fully understand and fully characterize all of the lines that we've developed in our program. So every single plant that was developed in the doubled haploid lab becomes a plot in our field nursery where we gather all of the agronomic characteristics and quality characteristics to be able to make some advancements. And so the best way for me to give you an overview of our, our field program is to show you a video that we were able to shoot with our own drone. So I'm going to stop sharing and then I'll start sharing our drone video. All right, so this first image is of the seeding that takes place in our nursery. And so each one of those seed packages is a, from a plant that was developed in our doubled halfway process. And here's just another image of our, of our nurseries. And you can kind of see from green to yellow that there's a difference in 
the days to flowering. And so we can already start to see how drones can participate in the ability to gather an immense amount of data. Here is our yield plot. So this is something on a much bigger scale so that we can really evaluate yield because at the end of the day, the farmers need the yield to maximize value on their farm. Okay, this is an example of um, combining or harvesting our, our plots in the, in the nursery. This is a really small combine that we use to be able to, to um, identify yield and, and then gather data for our, our chemistry lab, from our chemistry lab. Um, here's an example of our pure seed sites. And this is where we've identified lines that we then need to bulk up in pure seeds. So we use tents and leaf cutters to be able to increase pollination. And here is um, experimental hybrid production in Chile. So once we've identified the males and the females that we'd like to combine, we make many different permutations and combinations. We put them in these tents to be able to increase the, the seed um, that we need then to evaluate the various hybrids that we would then evaluate in North America. And so this is on a much bigger scale. So we've got the pure seed that we do in North America, and then that seed gets sent over to Chile for us to be able to do our increase for the hybrid experimental hybrid seed production. And then that seed gets sent back to Canada where we then can do all of the experimental hybrid evaluation. And so this year more than ever, our breeders are unable to go to Chile to do a lot of the agronomic evaluations and assessments that they normally do. And so this year more than ever, we're relying on a lot of drone technology to be able to do a lot of the characterizing for us. And that is everything I have. Does anyone have any questions for me? Oh, that was awesome. Thank you so much, Zoe. And, and the nice sunny warm weather reminds us that <laughs> it wasn't over that long ago. Um, we do have a question from Miller. Um, so they were wondering where in Canada is this? Is it in Saskatchewan? That's a really good point. So we have a number of field plots all across all across um, Western Canada. So we have our nursery trials here in Saskatoon, just right outside of the city, you know, near the Berry Barn is one of our locations. Um, but we also have sites in Alberta and sites in Manitoba. So there are certain areas that are impacted more by things like uh, blackleg or clubroot. And so we make sure to have uh, plots there so that we can continue to evaluate our, our material in, in kind of the, the conditions that the farmers have to work with. Okay, awesome. Um, and then I also have a question, you touched on it, um, but how has COVID really impacted your research and your um, kind of everyday um, tasks? Right, so COVID has completely changed how myself and the managers are working. Uh, we made the decision in March to send home anyone that was able to work from home and we did that because we, we were considered essential. And so we needed to find ways to continue the research at our facility. So we've got labs and greenhouse facilities here in Saskatoon. And so we sent home anyone who has kind of a desk job or, or managers who can handle a lot of the meetings virtually. And that allowed our technical team to, to uh, stay working with reduced exposure. So a lot of us have had to quickly learn how to to operate in this virtual environment. And we've, we've had a lot of success, I'd have to say. So it's been, it's been interesting and different, but um, overall we've been able to maintain productivity, which is great. Okay, awesome. Oh, that's so good. And I do have one question. This is, this is my um, area, this is my background that you're talking about. So I'm, I'm very, very interested, but um, what are some of the traits that, that you really, that are desirable that you wanna select for? I know you talked about disease resistance. Um, what are some of the other traits that you you really wanna hone in on? And right, so so we do look for genes or, and molecular markers to track those genes for the disease traits, like I mentioned, black leg and club root. Mm -hmm. We have molecular markers for herbicide tolerance. So whether that's, Clearfield or Roundup or Liberty. 
and, and that allows us to introgress those herbicide tolerant genes into elite lines that we're working with. Um, and then we, you know, we are hybrid crops, so we also have molecular markers that determine hybridity. So we've got our, our female pool and we've got our male pool. And when we cross those together, we create an F1. Um, and that is the, the F1 is the, the seed that we sell to the farmers. And so we have molecular markers to help us identify those different pools. Okay. Scatter tolerance is another trait that we're interested in, in being able to, to molecularly characterize and then develop molecular markers to track that trait. That's awesome. Okay, thank you so much. This was so, so interesting. Um, this, and we're perfectly on time, which is also really great. So thank you so much, Zoe, we really appreciate that. And just a reminder, if there's any questions out there, just to put them in the chat and we will um, address those after each speaker. Um, but now we are on to Heather at Quantum Genetics. If Heather's there, I see her. Um, and she is going to um, discuss what she does in her, in her lab. And I will mute myself. So take it away, Heather. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Heather Diebalt, and I'm the general manager here at Quantum Genetics. Um, we're located in uh, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Um, so we're a private biotechnology company, and we were actually started by a student that came out of the University of Saskatchewan. Um, he was a farmer, and there was some research that was being done at the university um, that he saw an opportunity to develop a business into. Um, and so basically he did that. He took that technology and um, has created a company that has had, um, you know, different opportunities of growth um, over the years. So that's kind of exciting to have that uh, happening right here in, in Saskatchewan and Saskatoon. Um, we have about 15 to 20 employees, um, depending on the time of the year. Um, because we work in agriculture, there's different times of the year where there's, uh, where we need more employees, obviously during um, harvest and the times when our um, our tests are needed more uh, in demand, I guess. Uh, most of the people that work here have uh, either a degree from, a lot of them are actually from the University of Saskatchewan. Um, they've either gone through agriculture or something in the sciences like chemistry, um, microbiology. Um, we often also have uh, students that take the lab technology uh, course at um, SIAST or uh, I forget what it's called now, but the the diploma program um, here in Saskatoon. Um, and, and basically what we do, most of our tests um, are developed with a, a, obviously an agricultural um, background or a need. And so what we do is help farmers uh, make decisions basically on their farm um, through genetics and using genomics. So we offer tests that they can help make them uh, make more informed decisions on their farm um, through genetics. So within our company, we have two sides. Um, we have a crop side and a, a cattle side. So on our crop side, we look at basically a bunch of different fungal diseases that happen in plants. Um, so one of these diseases, which Zoe also mentioned is sclerotinia. So this is a, a fungal disease that happens in canola. Um, and then we also have a, a test that we do in fusarium, um, which is in wheat and barley. Um, and then we have some soil borne uh, funguses that we test for. Uh, one of these diseases is called aphenomyces. Um, this is a disease that comes out in the soil when it's more uh, wet conditions and it affects uh, lentils and pulse crops. And then we also have a test that we do for club root. Uh, on the cattle side, uh, we look at different traits that affect uh, the herd improvement or that farmers can use to in, uh, improve the genetics on their farm. Um, we also look at performance traits. So farmers want to have bulls that have a high breeding capacity, um, if they have cows, they want ones that have good milk production. Um, and then we work in uh, feedlots and actually a lot of the feedlots we work with are either in uh, Southern Alberta or we have a large feedlot in Texas that we work with. Um, and with them, we're helping them uh, identify which animals in their feedlots are going to finish faster, um, lay down fat at a higher rate. Um, and then we tell them when the optimal time for slaughter is uh, when the cattle are coming out of their feedlot. And then we also do some uh, testing with food safety with antimicrobial and levels of, of different um, microbes in the manure or in the pens and uh, swine barns and uh, chicken barns and stuff like that. 
So for today, um, I'm going to focus on Q-Protect, which is the test that we do in canola. Um, so basically what it is, is we detect the presence of the crop pathogen um, in the plant. And then once we uh, identify if the pathogen is there, uh, we can help predict how much of the disease is going to, uh, how the disease is going to impact the crop and what type of a yield loss they're going to have. And then farmers know um, if they should be spraying their field or not. Um, a typical cost for a farmer to spray uh, one a quarter of canola um, could be upwards of four to $5,000. Um, and without using a test like this, um, they're basically making a blind decision because they don't know if that fungus is present or not because it's at such a microscopic uh, level. So how the disease works, um, on the right hand side here you can see um, a, a little picture of some mushrooms. There's a penny there just to show how small these spore, these uh, mushrooms actually are. Uh, so in the top of these mushroom uh, capsules, there's a whole bunch of um, tiny little microscopic spores that get ejected out um, into the air uh, when there's moist conditions. Um, and then these spores will land on the petals of the canola. Um, and then once the, the petals begin to fall off the plant, um, this, the petals will land onto the leaf foliage and then they'll start infecting the plant and causing um, basically parts of the plant to die off. And that will affect uh, the yield of the crop and ultimately the, um, the payback or the money that the farmer would, would normally make on the plant or on the crop. Um, so here's a picture showing what happens when those infected leaves hit uh, a piece of leaf foliage. Um, so you can see that the, the plant starts to die off and the disease starts to take over the, the foliage or the, the crotch of the plant where the, uh, the stems and the branch meet. So with Q-Protect, um, what we have is a, a number of these kits. Um, we have them at distribution over uh, across Western Canada <clears throat> at different locations. And then farmers can also have us send them out to them. Um, so basically they're just a package, um, uh, a little bag package. And inside that bag, there's 40 labeled tubes, um, like on the right hand side here of the screen. Uh, so what the farmer does is they go out to their field and they'll go to the four corners of the field in the center of their field. Um, and we call each of those a site. And at each of those sites, um, they're literally just going to pick petals from the plant and we tell them to do it from the top and middle uh, and bottom of the plant to get a good representation. And they'll stuff all those petals into a tube and then they'll package up all 40 tubes from across the field um, and send that into our lab. Uh, so they fill out a little bit of paperwork and they either drop it off or courier it in and then we will analyze the sample. Uh, and look, basically what we're looking for is little, uh, the microscopic DNA that's on those petals. Um, we go through a number of solutions and steps in the lab, and then we can let them know if that fungus is present. So with this disease, um, the timeliness of when you need to spray is probably a three, uh, three to four day window. Um, so during that time we have, our staff is working, or our lab is actually open, um, between eight and 18 hours a day. Um, and Stacy will show you some uh, really cool machines that we can uh, start up and have running after our staff leaves and then they can access the machines and, and data from home uh, so that we can get the results out as quickly as possible. So this is an example uh, of one of the uh, forms that we would, or um, results that we would send out to the farmer after they send in their samples. Um, so there's five different sites here on the left hand side. So each of these is one of those areas of the field where they went and collected the petals. Um, and then basically what we do is just tell them um, at that site, uh, one out of eight of those tubes tested positive or had spore activity. And then we give them an overall percent positive. So in this case, 20% um, of that field basically had uh, infection or the fungal spores present. Um, and then we've developed a risk barometer at the bottom here with this color schematic. Um, so basically if the results come back and it's in uh, the 20% area, so in the green zone here, um, the farmer knows that they likely don't need to spray uh, their field at that time. And if it comes back at 40% um, or higher, which is starting to get into the red zone here, um, then they know there's enough uh, spore level there that they would wanna um, take an action and go and spray their field. So one uh, thing that was really uh, kind of a cool thing to do in the last uh, couple of years or last year, um, we developed in-house an app. Um, so instead of farmers just getting a PDF or a, a Word document of the results, um, we worked with an in-house programmer to design um, an app that farmers could get their results pushed through to onto their phone. So basically what we did was take that result sheet that I showed you on the previous slide 
um, and we present it through an app. Um, so you can see here that they can put in some different calculations. Um, they'll, this will incorporate the level of spores in their field, and then this arrow will move along the risk barometer here. Um, so in this case, the, uh, the results came back and they're at 10% in the green zone. Um, so this farmer would know that he doesn't need to spray his field. Um, if it had come back and it was over here in the red zone, then he would know his uh, field has a high level of the, the spores present and he's gonna need to spray his field. Um, so even though we are mostly scientists and doing laboratory work, um, it's a really cool um, opportunity here because there's so many different um, other things that are going on. Um, so if you had a bit of a techie side and you wanted to, uh, you know, focus more on, you know, building an app or contributing to that, um, that's something else um, that you can that you can do here, even if you, you know, just came from a science background. And I think that's one of the things that I find is really unique about uh, Quantum is that because we're a small company, um, people aren't just targeted into doing. Um, one job. There's a variety of jobs that um, everybody does because we all need to pull together uh, to make things work when, when you have a, a smaller company. Um, so this is a map um, basically showing um, at the end of the year, we put out a map showing all the test fields that we've tested across Western Canada. So this one focuses more on um, Saskatchewan, but basically what it's showing is that there's different variations of the um, disease and infection across Saskatchewan. So the yellow dots are representing and green dots are representing areas of Saskatchewan where there was lower levels of disease and the red and orange areas are showing levels where there was higher levels of disease. So it's really interesting for farmers just to see, um, say in the swift current area, uh, we had all different types of levels uh, in that area showing um, that some farmers do need to spray their fields and other farmers um, maybe this year didn't need to spray, to spray their fields depending on their test. So I'll just uh, tell you a little bit of, I guess, about how I, I got to be here at Quantum. Um, I grew up on a mixed cattle and grain farm in Southwest Saskatchewan. Um, I graduated from Hodgeville High School. Uh, I think there was 12 people in my graduating class. Um, and so then I went to the University of Lethbridge um, and I actually went there, uh, I was more interested in um, computers and whatnot at that time. So I went there and went into the arts and science program. Uh, and then during the summer, I uh, took a job because of my agricultural background um, with a research company and worked on some of the, the research farms uh, similar to what Zoe had, had done there. And I really enjoyed being out, outside and working with the uh, combines and cedars and I just knew that that was kind of a passion of mine that I didn't realize I had uh, after growing up on a farm. Um, so then I decided to switch over into agriculture and I moved to the University of Saskatchewan. Um, so that's one thing I would encourage you if you're not really sure what you wanna do, um, take, uh, take the time during the summer to try and either volunteer or if you can um, get a job in an area that you're interested in because it can really help you make the, the decision of where you want to be or to know if you want a, an office job or if you want to be working outside or it, it kind of it really helped me anyways decide what I wanted to do for my career. Um, after I finished at the University of Saskatchewan um, when I was doing my undergrad thesis um, part of the work I was working on I'd made a connection with someone in Scotland at the Forestry Commission um, so I was really fortunate that I was able to go over there and uh, work for three months for the Forestry Commission there and then I traveled around uh, Europe a little bit. And then I came back to Saskatchewan and I started um, applying for jobs. Um, in the meantime, this is around the time that quantum genetics was just uh, starting up. Um, so they had a part-time job, so I took it. Um, and the funny story is that I always tell my bosses in the first three weeks, I was um, cutting hairs and extracting, which Stacy's gonna show you a little bit about later. Um, but at the time I remember thinking, I'm not staying here very long, this is not gonna be like my career and um, it's 17 years later and I'm still here. So, um, you know, even once you get your job there's always gonna be changes and uh, hopefully opportunity to do for, for growth. Um, so while I was at uh, working with quantum genetics I went back and got my master's of science um, because I started having uh, more interest in animal genomics and genetics because that was kind of where the company was going at that time. Um, so I went back and did that. Um, and yeah, it's been 17 years and I'm still here and it's still uh, really exciting. I, I enjoy my work. Um, I think it's exciting too for uh, women to be in agriculture and able to contribute and do things um, even though we're not actually on farm. Um, science is a way that you can still be a part of it 
and um, in Saskatchewan is such a huge part of our our industry. Um, so I find there is you know always a seems to be a lot of jobs and opportunity and and all kinds of different areas. So um, with that, I'm going to let Stacy um, take over. She's going to tell you a little bit more about the science side of it and uh, give a little tutorial tour through the lab for you. Hi guys, I'm uh, Stacy Howie and I'm the lab manager here at Quantum Genetics. So I kind of just manage the day-to-day -day testing of uh, the samples that come into the lab. So I'm just going to go through a little bit of basics of molecular genetics. You guys have probably maybe learned this in some of your classes. So here's just some terminology. It's kind of like our language here. Um, DNA. So what is DNA? Well, they are the building blocks of life. They're made up of four different DNA bases. And they're A, C's, T's, and G's. Um, also, an allele is refers to a section or sequence of this DNA. A chromosome, they're tight packages of DNA sequences, and we get one copy from each of our parents. So a gene, which is what I will talk a little bit more about later, is a sequence of DNA that is translated, which means it has a function. So it makes proteins or hormones. Um, it's what your body turns on a protein that tells your fingers to grow fingernails, for instance. Um, a mutation is a DNA sequence that differs among individuals. It what makes us different and the same. A genotype is a set of alleles associated with a trait. So this is something we can't see. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. A phenotype is means we can see it. So hair color, weight, whether an animal has horns or not, et cetera. So I'll just go a little bit through about kind of different procedures that we do in the lab. Um, we study DNA and the genes within that DNA. So DNA is invisible to the naked eye. So in order for us to be able to study it, we first have to get it out of the cell. So there are three basic steps to DNA extraction. The first step is a lysis step, and we add a detergent to break open the cell and release the DNA from the nucleus. The second step is a precipitation step. This is where we add a highly concentrated salt solution, and this separates the DNA that has been released from the cell from the mass mashup of cell parts. The th third and final step is a purification step. This is where we add alcohol, either ethanol or isopropyl alcohol, just like rubbing alcohol. And this cleans the extra cell debris out of the solution. And then we have a purified DNA sample. So in the lab, we use kind of a more complicated setup of these steps, but the, the main chemical procedure is the same. So once we have the DNA out of the cell, how do we look at the genes that we want to look at? For instance, like Heather explained earlier, we in plant in the canola plants, we're looking for the disease sclerotinia. We're looking for that fungal DNA. So we use a technique and procedure called PCR or polymerase chain reaction. And this is a technique that uses a molecular and enzymatic cocktail that will amplify our DNA of interest and it'll generate billions of copies of DNA. And then we can observe those with our laboratory instruments. So here's just a little sort of animation of how PCR works. So DNA is double-stranded and when you heat it up to 95 degrees Celsius, it splits into two and becomes single-stranded. We can then use primers which are specific to our DNA of interest and they will bind to that DNA. So the yellow um, lines there are primers and the green line is what we call a probe and that is labeled with a specific dye and it can be only viewed at a specific wavelength. So the instrument will then through a series of heating and cooling steps make another copy of DNA so on and so forth. And it's an exponential growth. And at the end of about 40 cycles, 
we end up with about 68 billion copies of DNA, which then makes it so our laboratory instruments can take a picture and we can view the amplification curve and that gives us our results and our laboratory technicians can analyze that. So I'm just gonna show you a little bit about um, how samples come into the lab. And then I'm gonna show you a video about how those samples are processed. So when we do um, livestock genetics testing, we get a variety of samples in the lab. They can be hair samples or tissue samples. Sometimes we'll get blood samples or semen or um, nasal swabs. The most common types are tissue and hair. So for tissue samples, we've developed this a DNA capture system and we use a tagger that looks like this. And we have a DNA tag that looks like this. And it is labeled with a barcode. So when it comes back into the lab, it can be tracked. We also then use a special orange punch that will capture a piece of cartilage from the animal's ear and put it into this DNA tag. So the animal's ear goes through here and then they just, the farmer, the customer will close the tagger onto the animal's ear and it'll capture the DNA. And at the end, it'll look like this and the orange punch is like stuck inside here. And then we can cut the top of this off and it will, the piece of cartilage will be inside there and we can extract the DNA from that. The other type of sample that we get is a hair sample and it usually comes in an envelope like this and the customer will pull the hairs from the animal's tail and they'll include their customer information as well as any corresponding animal names or tattoos or anything like that. And once that sample comes into the lab, we will give it a numerical lab identification with a barcode and then that number follows the sample throughout the lab process. So I'm just gonna, we're just gonna show you a video about what day-to-day -day life looks like here at Quantum Genetics. The first step in the lab is to prep the sample for DNA extraction. This is done by cutting the hair root off of the shaft of the hair and placing it into a small tube. We usually cut between 10 and 25 hairs depending on the method of extraction we are going to use. We have many lab technicians here at Quantum that have different backgrounds of education. Hi, my name is Evelyn. I work as a lab technician here at Quantum and I study microbiology and immunology at the University of Saskatchewan. The second step in the lab is to extract the DNA from the hair sample. In this method we are using today is we're using, we'll add a series of solutions and then we'll use heat to allow the cell to burst open and release the DNA. This is a very quick method. It usually only takes about 20 minutes. Um, we do have other longer methods that result in a more purified DNA. Hi, I'm Eiji San Miguel. I used to be a nurse in the Philippines, but now I am working as a lab technician here in quantum genetics. Uh, I've been working here for 10 years, almost 10 years now. Thank you. Once the DNA has been extracted, it is transferred to the PCR lab, where a small volume of DNA is transferred using a pipette to a PCR plate. You can see that is what Meiji is doing right now. A mixture of PCR enzymes or a cocktail is then added to the DNA that was just put into the PCR plate.
once those transfer steps are completed, the plate is then sealed and placed in our lab instrument for analysis of our genes of interest. Once the PCR setup is complete, we can load our mini hub here on the left, anywhere from one to 48 plates, and we can, and we, our robotic arm will load and unload our PCR instrument and run 24 hours a day if we want to. So we can set it up before we leave for the day and it'll run all night long and it'll usually send us a text message or an email if it um, has an error and we can log on remotely and fix it and it can continue running. Once the PCR is complete, we can then use the software on the computer to analyze the results. Once the results have been analyzed, we can upload them to our database and we can generate a report and send that report out to the customer. Thanks for watching. Just trying to get our presentation back up. So now that you've seen kind of what the lab looks like and how we get that DNA and how we test it, how are we going to apply this to livestock genetics testing? One of our main um, tests that we do is called QLink which essentially is just um, parentage testing for cattle. So the customer will send in any calf samples or the, the, the offspring samples, and they'll usually send in a bull sample or several bull samples. And these are what we call like potential parents. And using this tool, they can uh, measure their bull and herd performance and manage the transfer performance traits. So they can determine whether or not a bull is transferring on the desired traits that they like. So we'll talk a little bit about heritability. Um, you may have learned in your classes about Punnett squares. So these are typical Punnett squares. Um, on the left here, you can see we have the mom alleles. If she's a CC for a particular gene and the dad is a TT for a particular gene, then 100% of the time, we're, we're only gonna get a CT in the offspring. With CT is what we call a heterozygote, which means it has one of each allele for that gene. But on the right here, if you see that the mom is a CT, but the dad is a TT, all of a sudden now we can, 50% of the time, we'll have a CT offspring, or a, and then 50% of the time we'll have a TT offspring. In lots of genes um, that we study, a what we call a homozygote, which means it has just one of the alleles or two copies of an allele, that's a desired genotype. So uh, customers will use this as a breeding tool to breed for a specific genotype that they want. So in QLink, we test each calf and each possible parent for 128 different genes. We have an internal database that will perform a comparison between the calf and each potential parent. And then these results are then reported to the customer as each calf having a potential match. So for instance, in a pasture or a field with multiple bulls, farmers may not know how many calves each bull is producing and if those desired traits are being passed on to the calf. So our database kind of looks similar, oops. Our database looks similar to this um, sort of chart on the right here. So you can see here if we have gene one, two and three on the top, we would have 128 of that. So our database would show 128 different genes on the top. And we have the calf results here and potential parent A and potential parent B. These, in this case, these would be potential dads. So you can see here on gene one, if the calf has a C and a T and potential parent A is a T, T, T and a potential parent B is a CC, 
Well, each parent, each parent gives off, can only, will give one of those alleles. So this calf will get one of these alleles from their dad and one of these alleles from their, from their mom. So in this case, we know that potential parent A can be a match because it's going to give a T and potential parent B can be a match as well because it's going to give a C and it has both. Now, if we look at gene two, if calf is TT, calf one is TT, potential parent A is a CC and potential parent B is a CT, we know that parent B can be a match because it can give this T and calf one has a T as well. But potential parent A cannot be a match because it can only give a C and we don't see a C here. So given all of this uh, comparison, our database will within like 30 seconds, we'll make these comparisons and we'll generate a report that will say CAF1 is qualified to parent B. And then we can send that report out to the customer. So using these results, our customers can um, decide which bulls have like superior genetics, which, which bulls are passing on the traits that they deem important. Um, if a bull is not siring any calves, then they can make the decision whether or not to keep that bull in their herd or not. So how did I get started in agriculture? Well, I graduated high school in Melfort, Saskatchewan, which is about two hours northeast of Saskatoon. Um, I grew up in a non-farming family, but I always had a passion for animals and um, wanted to pursue veterinary medicine. So I worked uh, part-time at our local veterinary clinic on the weekends, um, just helping out in the office and taking dogs for walks and things like that. And um, uh, in high school, I guess, um, for classes that I took, I kind of took all the maths and sciences that I could just because I wanted to attend the College of Agriculture and they kind of recommended that you kind of have everything that you can. So. so after graduating high school, I attended the U of S and went to the College of Agriculture, majoring in animal science. And I quickly learned that there are many more opportunities in the agriculture industry besides a career in veterinary medicine. So, and I was lucky enough to spend two summers uh, during university at Vito Interback working as a summer student. Um, Vito is a research lab organization here in Saskatoon, and they're actually doing research on uh, vaccine research and development here for COVID-19, which is pretty cool. So during my summers there, I worked in the lab and I realized that I really enjoyed that. And I wanted to pursue a career in um, like lab science. And if I could stay in the agriculture industry while doing that, that would be a huge bonus because I'd be able to use the knowledge that I learned in my animal science degree and apply it to my job. So after four years, um, at the U of S, I graduated with a Bachelor's of Science in Agriculture, and shortly after that, I started my career here at Quantum Genetics, and I've been here for 14 years, and I really just enjoy every day. Um, I really am like a lifelong learner, and every day I learn something new. I learn a new technique. I learn a new concept. I I'm learning about plant, more and more about plant genetics, which I didn't know before and coming from an animal science background. So I really am just really loving the growth and opportunity that the agriculture industry provides. Are there any questions? Okay, there were a couple of questions. So Kyla McNally, um, while you were demonstrating the um, the DNA sampler, he said, uh, or they said, that looks familiar. Is that like Y tex ear tags? Yeah, you bet. So it's a Y tex ear tagger, and we've just modified it to fit our DNA tag and special punch. 
Awesome. And then we had a question from Caitlin R in Broadview. Um, can you do that process, PCR, with a hair sample or hair follicle sample? Does it matter? Um, generally, like the DNA lives within the hair follicles. So when we cut the hair, we cut the fo hair follicle off into the tube and that's where the DNA is located. So we try to get as, as little of the hair shaft as possible. Okay. And then we have a question from Roland K. in Momart. Um, do you use CRISPR or Cas9? Oh, interesting. That's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> um, we actually use um, TACMAN chemistry. So I don't know if you know what that is, but we design all our own assays. So we design our own primers and we design our own probes and we make our own PCR master mix, which includes TAC polymerase, water, buffer, magnesium, salts, or nucleotides, so. Okay, and actually maybe Zoe, I'll ask you the same question. Do you use CRISPR in your lab at all or Cas9? So again, that is an excellent question. And at Nutrien, we do not have a transformation or, or gene editing facility. However, we have a number of partners where we do collaborate with third parties to develop uh, new, new varieties that have gene edited traits. And so we do have some collaborations with uh, CRISPR, using CRISPR. Awesome, great questions, everyone. Um, Heather and Stacy, I'm gonna ask you the same question um, regarding COVID. Um, how has COVID changed um, how things happen in, in your lab or how you do things day to day? Um, well, at the start, uh, we did have our office staff, the more administrative or people that scientists that are working in their offices um, were working from home. Um, the lab staff in the back, um, they did staggered shifts uh, for a couple of months. Um, but because our one of our busiest seasons starts kind of um, in the oh, mid-June, um, at that time, we asked all of the staff to come back. Um, we have a pretty large facility here, so there is um, ample space for social distancing. And then we just limited the number of uh, technicians in each of the lab spaces uh, to adhere to social spacing, I guess. Um, but we're pretty fortunate that our business was, um, because farmers are still uh, planting their, their crops and still harvesting, and cattle are still you know, out in the pens and and going to slaughter and whatnot, that it, it really hasn't affected us too, too much. Um, so we've been able to carry on um, like before we like we did before uh, pre-COVID, I guess. No, that's awesome. Yeah, and what I'm, I'm hearing from everybody is the science never stops. It um, maybe some of the, the ways we do things change, but the science keeps going. So no, that's fantastic. Um, another thing I wanted to mention is that each one of our presenters today have talked about the importance of summer experience and really getting out there, um, trying to find your interests, um, what, uh, what some various skills are. Uh, summer jobs really are a great way to kind of dip your toes into the workforce and, and see what's out there. Um, yeah, Renette's just reminding us to all go to the website, um, rdiec.ca to fill out the student survey. Um, but other than that, I don't have anything um, else. Um, any of our presenters want to um, say anything else? If not, no? Okay, great. Well, thank you all so much. Thanks for um, these wonderful presentations. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Stacy. These were great. And thank you to all the schools for participating. We really appreciate this. Um, for those students that um, asked some um, questions, we will definitely put your name in for that draw and get you some Subway gift.